Hi, everybody. Well, thanks for coming. Uh, we've got some important things to talk about today. Um, this session is called Writing Web Apps in Go. My name is Rob Pike. I'm presenting with Andrew Durand, and we're both uh, members of the Go team at Google in Mountain View and in Sydney. Uh, during this session, if you have feedback you'd like to give or other items uh, you'd like to talk about, there's a link to the, uh, this short link will give you a, a site for feedback. And then uh, here's a couple of hashtags that you might want to use. But uh, you could also use the Golang hashtag. We won't get mad. Um, so uh, some of you might not know what Go is exactly. Uh, so I thought we'd spend just a couple minutes talking about that. Um, Go is a programming language uh, for the world of today. If you look at what happened in the last uh, 20 years or so, the computing environment has changed a lot, and not all the languages have really kept pace. So Go is designed inside Google to be a fun, efficient, and productive way to write the kind of software that we write at Google, which mostly means things in the manner of web servers and things like that. Most importantly of all, though, it's an open source language. Everything about it is done in, in the open. It is not a proprietary thing in any important way. Um, it launched in November 2009, and it had the goals of being fun to work in, efficient, scalable, and um, very, very productive. And as I said, we designed it for web servers, but it sort of works really well for just about anything, which was a bit of a surprise to us. And so we now prefer to just call it a good general purpose language. And there are contributors now from all around the world working on it. So today, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what's gone on since the last talk at I.O. a year ago. Uh, we're going to show you a web server that's written in Go and how to uh, deploy Go in production. Uh, you might know a little bit about what that's about today. Um, we assume you know a little bit about how to write web servers, maybe a little bit about Go, but it's not totally important. You'll get the gist of it even if you're completely new to the language. We've got some big announcements, some of which have already leaked, which is fine with us. Um, and there's some uh, giveaways, too. Last year, we gave away t-shirts. Maybe we'll give something else away today. So be sure to stick around till the end when all the fun really comes together. So what's happened in the past year? Um, it's been a really big year for Go. There's been tons of stuff happen. Uh, perhaps the biggest news of all uh, has been that it's now supported on Windows entirely through the efforts of an open source community. We did none of this work internally at, on the team at, at, at Google which is very, very satisfying for us. There's also a couple of external application, uh, sorry, external compilers that have been done. Uh, there's a compiler in the works called Ergo, and there's also a, an, an interpreter with a JIT that runs on Windows and it is now starting to support .NET. It's called Express Go. We're really excited about that. The, um, our own internal uh, port for the ARM is now very solid and available. For, it works on all kinds of, of phones and things like that. Uh, GCC 4.6, the release, includes GCC Go as an official language. It's included with things like uh, Ubuntu and stuff like that. Um, there's Swig support and, and on and on and on. For those of us who write code for a living, it's nice to be able to say that GDB is now well supported, or Go is now well supported by GDB. And here's a sort of silly trace. It's kind of hard to show a GDB slide that's, that's not just uh, modem noise. But you can see, um, it, you know what modems are? Are you guys too? <laughs> um, you guys uh, will recognize things like uh, the runtime, knowing about Go routines, and you can talk about threads, and, uh, and ch uh, as well as Go routines and channels, and it's all—it's really quite nice. It's, it's all symbolic debugging now in GDB, and that's also uh, getting better all the time. Um, in the past year, the language has simplified. Unlike uh, some other languages we could name, we'd like to keep Go really clean and simple. And to that end, we've actually removed some things from the language in order to make the language better which I think is a sign of the kind of stuff we really care about. But the language actually gets better through doing this. So non-blocking communication operations went away because they were confusing semantically. And it turns out the select statement can, can provide all you need there anyway. Uh, we got rid of the closed built-in because it, people tended to misuse it. It was very subtle to use well and very racy. Um, we clarified the type sizes for floats and complexes, which simplified some, made, made the math libraries much nicer to use. Slices got simpler. Uh, the dot, dot, dot thing, which is how you do variatics, actually got a lot nicer. Um, and we actually put in a, an append built in, which clarified a lot of code. Composite literals got easier to type. But basically, the thing just got sort of more regular and, and I think a lot cleaner. And it continues to develop. As I have mentioned many times, it's entirely open source. Uh, I mentioned the Windows port. Uh, we've had over 1,000 contributions from more than 130 people around the world. Uh, we won a Best of Open Source Award from InfoWorld, which was really nice. 
And I think what really pleased me about this award was, besides getting the award, the citation really seems to understand what it is that Gitco is trying to do. So it was very satisfying. Um, now, when we first launched Go in November 2009, we called it a systems language. And that seemed to confuse people. Um, people seem to think that means it's for writing really low-level grungy code, operating systems, maybe file systems, things like that. And I think Go is an interesting language to do those in. But we had a somewhat higher level, grander idea. That it, it really was for the kind of software we write at Google. But as I said before, it was a bit of a surprise to us that it turned out to be a great general purpose language. And if people have been using it to do a lot of scripting, um, a lot of, of sort of uh, administrative stuff, and various, various things that we really didn't have in mind, but it turns out to be good for. That said, it's still really good for writing, for writing systems code like web servers, such as the one that Andrew will now show you. Andrew. Thanks. Can somebody, t ah, hello. Um, so my name's Andrew, and I'm gonna show you uh, our, the development of a complete web application um, called Mustachio. And Mustachio is our bid to enter this uh, burgeoning market of, of photo and image sharing. Um, good way to get venture capital, I hear. Um, the, the core functionality of this program is uh, the ability to upload an image or a photograph, to draw a mustache on that photograph, and then to share it with your friends. Um, so this, uh, in this way, I hope to demonstrate how Go shines at um, serving web pages and templated HTML, handling file uploads, working with the file system, and importantly, uh, manipulating and decoding and encoding images. And we'll also show uh, interacting with um, OAuth authenticated APIs. So uh, this is the simple Hello Web server. Um, if you access this web server on port 8080, you will see a, uh, a, the, the string Hello World. And so the way this works is we import the string formatting in HTTP packages. We define an HTTP handler. And what the handler does is simply write the string hello world to the HTTP response writer. And that sends that string as the HTTP response. And then in our main function, uh, we have a handle func call which uh, registers that handler to our web root. Um, and then a listen and serve call to actually set up and run the web server. Um, and so our, uh, the beginning of our Mustachio program um, will simply handle a file upload and show the image to the user. And this is the uh, request and response flow of, of uh, that process. So initially when the user visits our Mustachio, they issue a get request and the upload handler will serve them a form. Um, the form will include a, uh, a file input field and then the, uh, the user will post an image back to the upload handler. And the upload handler will save the image to disk redirect them to slash view with the image ID, and then uh, when the user requests slash view, the view handler will serve them the image data proper. So here's our simple HTML form. I imagine it's familiar to most of you. It's just a simple HTML form um, in, with a multi-part form data encoding type um, and a file field named image. And so to uh, create an upload handler that, that displays that form, what we'll do is import the template package and as a global variable, create the variable upload template, um, which is the result of calling must pass file on that template. So um, in, in our new upload handler, we can call ex the execute method on that template to actually write the template out as the HTTP response. Um, and then we, in our main function, we register that handler to the web root. And now we need to to expand that upload handler to also accommodate handling the uploaded file. So our original code for the upload handler is still there in under this if statement if method is, is not equal to post. So if they've just done a get request, we serve them the form. If not, we're handling a post request. Um, and so we pull the form file out of the HTTP request, and then we open a temporary file using the temp file function from the IUtil package, and then we copy the contents of that form uh, file upload to our temporary file and then uh, redirect the user to slash view with the name, uh, the automatically assigned name of that temporary file. And so um, one thing that's important to notice here is that uh, there's a lot of error handling in this slide 
And in Go, we consider error handling to be very important because unhandled errors lead to, to bugs. Um, but it doesn't have to be uh, this verbose, and so let's look at a way of just um, cleaning up the error handling. Um, we, can, we can clean it up a bit by creating an error handler function that wraps our HTTP handler um, and returns a new HTTP handler that will catch errors effectively and display a nice HTML page uh, with an error message. And so that's what this error handler function does. It has a corresponding error template in, in the same style as the upload template. And then the important part here is on this first line of the main function, um, we now wrap the upload function with our error handler function. And then we, we modify our upload function to use this new check function, which will panic if it encounters an error, which will then be caught by the error handler. And so you can see that uh, compared to a couple of slides ago, um, the error handling is, is much simpler. It's just calls to check passing in the error. Um, so now uh, we need to define a handle of view to actually serve our image, and that will simply uh, set the content type to image so the browser will display it as an image, and then call the serve file helper to read the file from disk and write it uh, to the HTTP response. And then we need to add it um, with handle func to our HTTP muxer. Um, so I can demonstrate this in action for you now. Um, if I, uh, just running locally on my machine, um, I'll upload an image, and there it is being surfed back to me, oh, my little friend here. So now let's talk about moustaches. Uh, to draw our moustache, we're going to use uh, the FreeType Go library, which is a Go implementation of the FreeType font rendering library. Um, and it has a rasterization package called raster that draws, uh, gives us some anti-aliased curve drawing primitives. Um, and to use this library, we install it with Go install, uh, which is our part of the Go distribution. It's a tool for inst automatically downloading and installing uh, Go libraries. And we use Go install to install it. And that and once that's done, we can import the package from the same name that we go installed it from, which is nice and convenient. And so to actually draw our moustache, um, we'll use three Bezier curves, um, and we'll allow the user to uh, control the droop factor of the moustache um, by moving uh, some of the control points. And so the function to actually draw the moustache uh, looks like this. This is the first half. Um, at the it takes a an image.image, .image, which is Go's uh, internal image format, um, or part of the standard library, rather. It takes an X, X and Y coordinates for the moustache, uh, a size for the moustache, and the droop factor for the moustache, very important. Um, and at the top of this function, we set up our, um, the rasterizer to paint onto our image and uh, set up a new rasterizer, and then this block of, uh, of essentially just mathematics to define each of the control points involved in drawing the moustache. Um, it should be kind of familiar to anybody who doesn't need graphics programming, I guess. And then on the next slide, we actually uh, draw the three curves um, from the left, round to the right, and back down again. And at the bottom of the function, we call rasterize to actually draw to our image, and then we return the resulting image. But there's one, one uh, little detail about that uh, function that I haven't discussed, and that is that an image.image .image value is, a, is an interface type in Go, which means that it can represent um, any type of image. Uh, and, because, and that's appropriate in this case because uh, a user can upload uh, any arbitrary kind of valid image, and that might be in a variety of different color spaces. Um, it might be RGBA or grayscale or a fixed palette GIF file and so on. Um, but the raster library works best when it's used um, with an RGBA image. It's much easier to set up. And so at the top of the moustache function, I have this called the function RGBA. And it passes in uh, the provided image and, and returns an RGBA version of that image. Um, so let's just take a look at how that function actually works. Um, the RGBA function first uh, performs a type assertion. That's this first uh, line of code in the function there. Um, and it, it, but what this assertion is doing is asking the interface, is your underlying concrete type an RGBA image. And uh, if it is, then uh, this means that well, we can just return that, that concrete type. We don't have to do any more processing, and that's the, the fast path through here. 
Um, otherwise, uh, we just we create a new RGBA image and use the draw dot draw function to actually draw um, the existing image to our new RGBA image and then return it. So this is a kind of a very idiomatic uh, way of introspecting into interfaces, and it it, uh, it, come, it becomes very handy in a lot of situations. So now that we have our moustache drawing function, um, there's the matter of integrating that function um, with the rest. Uh, with the rest of our, our HTTP flow. So the first part of this diagram is uh, the same as, uh, as in the first example, but then instead of redirecting to a view handler to simply view the image, um, we're redirecting to an edit handler. And this edit handler will display an HTML page, which includes some JavaScript, and uh, that JavaScript will provide edit controls and allow you to place your moustache on the image and adjust it. And with each, each time you adjust the image, uh, adjust the moustache and play, move it around, the image tag that shows that image will be updated to include a new query string uh, with these X, Y, S, and D parameters to, sig to signify which parts of the image should be shown, uh, what, where the moustache and the image should be drawn. And then the image handler um, will actually draw the moustache and return that image um, so we're doing all of the, the rendering of this moustache on the server side, but updating it in real time. So the edit handler is very simple. It's much like the first version of our upload handler. Um, we just set up an edit template um, reading edit.html. And the one uh, difference is that we, actually in, we pass in the um, ID from our query string using the form value method on request so that the JavaScript can know which image ID uh, it's referring to when it's drawing the image on the screen. And our image function um, first upload, uh, opens the relevant file, um, image file, decodes that image, then it pulls the X, Y, S, and D parameters from the query request, um, and then uses the moustache function to draw on the image, and then it will serve the resulting image as an encoded JPEG um, at the bottom of that function. Um, but you see this is kind of a bit repetitive um, and kind of unnecessarily verbose. We can sort of clean that up a bit and make it a bit more general um, by just using a helper closure. Um, we define this closure v that takes a string and returns an integer, and that does the string conversion from um, strings to ints. And this is necessary because Go is a statically typed language. Um, and so uh, when we call moustache, um, we, we use v of x, v of y, et cetera. So I'll just demo that now, the fun part. Upload our image again. See, now we, can, now we actually have the edit controls in place. I can place the moustache. And um, you'll see as I, as I place the moustache, as I move it around, the, uh, here the image query string changes. I can adjust the, the size, make it uh, big and bushy or a little bit more sort of thin and dignified and also adjust the, uh, the, the droop factor, the all important. You can kind of go a little bit extreme if you want, go all the way. Um, I think it's, sort of, it's a happy occasion, so you make it slightly upturned, gentlemen. So now that we've drawn our moustache, it's time to move on to sharing this hilarious image with all of our friends. Um, so this is the, the latter part of the HTTP flow. From our edit.html template, um, we'll have a share link, which you might have seen when I was demoing just then. Um, and that share link will, will link, uh, links to the slash share handler um, and passes in the, uh, the, all the uh, definition of that image with moustache to the share handler. And the share handler uh, creates a redirect URL to Google's OAuth service. Um, and if you're familiar with OAuth service, this should make sense to you. Um, and I hope it makes sense to you regardless. Um, and it, the share handler redirects you to Google's OAuth service, and then the user will perform the little authentication and permission granting dance with Google's um, OAuth server, which usually means logging in and clicking an accept button. And then the OAuth service redirects the user back to our Mustachio app to uh, slash post, which is our post handler. And uh, it passes in an authentication code and um, the image state, which is those query parameters from before. Um, 
uh, when the post handler receives that data, it takes the authentication code and performs its own interaction with the OAuth service, exchanging that code for an authentication token. And then it uses that authentication token to make its authenticated post to uh, Google Buzz. And then the, uh, if that response comes back OK, our post handler will draw a congratulations, your image has been shared HTML page and show the image back to the user. Fortunately, it's a lot less complicated in the actual code. Um, to share the image on Google Buzz, we need to authenticate with OAuth, as I said. And to do that, we'll use the GoAuth2 library. And to install that again, we can use Go install, and again, we can import it under that path. And to set up the OAuth client, um, we need some configuration. Um, and so we set a global variable config, which is a, a, a pointer to OAuth config. And, um, and we set a client ID and client secret, which are obtained from the Google APIs console or whoever your, uh, your OAuth provider is. And we set um, some URLs to specify we're authenticating with the Buzz service and uh, that we want to use Google's OAuth servers. That's where those three URLs are. And the final and important URL uh, is the redirect URL, which is where OAuth should send the user back to uh, when the authentication exchange is completed. Um, and that's our post handler. So our share handler is very simple. It just looks like this. Um, we call the OAuth config URL method on our config, um, on our config object, um, passing in the, the raw query, which is our image definition, um, and then redirect the user to that URL to Google's OAuth service. Once Google has redirected the user back, um, they hit the post handler, um, and the post handler takes the authentication code in the image, um, and at the, at the top of this function, we set up an OAuth transport um, with our OAuth config. Um, we take the code and call the exchange method on that transport to um, authenticate that transport with an access token. And then we call our post photo function, which I haven't described yet, passing in an HTTP client made by the, H the OAuth transport and a URL that we want to post to our Buzzstream. And finally, if all of that succeeded, we uh, use the, uh, we post, we execute the post template, which will be our screen saying, congratulations, your image has been shared. So the post photo function is fairly straightforward. Um, it just forms a JSON encoded request, um, which I've omitted from this slide because everybody seems to know what a JSON blob looks like. Um, and then uh, makes an HTTP post to the Buzz API using the provided HTTP client, which is our OAuth authenticated HTTP client. Um, and so we just call the post method on client um, to the, to the uh, buzz API URL, um, type application JSON and our uh, JSON encoded request. Um, if everything is okay, if, if an error occurs, we return that error code or a custom error code, um, or we just return nil if, if everything went fine. Um, this, is, this is more than you'll need to do in the future to interact with Google APIs. Um, a more general Go client for Google APIs across the board is being developed, um, and it should simplify a lot of this kind of code. So let's demo the sharing. So I have my, uh, my Go for image, and I'll, I, I want to share it. So I click Share. I get sent to Google. And I'm asked, Mustachio is requesting permission to manage your buzz activity. I allow the access. And then it says, the image has been posted. And now if I go to my buzz stream, it should magically appear. And there it is. Ah, but the image is broken. And the reason why is because if you look at the URL, I'm running on localhost 8080, and the buzz servers can't actually access my local machine running on a private network to grab that thumbnail. Um, but when we, when we move it to production, um, I hope that this problem will be alleviated. So to talk about going to production, I invite Rob back um, to demonstrate that. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, while I was sitting back there and Andrew was talking, I noticed there are relatively few laptops open, but a surprisingly large number of tablets. I, I don't know what that's about. Um, so once we have your, our little mustachio program running locally, we obviously want to deploy it for the world to enjoy. And of course, that requires a platform for doing it. And so we're delighted today to announce that uh, Go is supported on Google App Engine. <laughs> um, 
which means he's going to need his flight goggles or he's not going to be able to be ready for this. Okay. So, um, now I don't know how many of you are familiar with App Engine. Um, it's, it's definitely a slightly different way of building the app, but it's fundamentally the same ideas. It's just some things are different. Some of the APIs change a little bit. So I'm going to talk uh, in very brief terms about the changes you need to make to the code that Andrew showed you in order to have it run on App Engine. Um, one of the big differences is that uh, in the App Engine uh, setup for Go, the main function is actually run by App Engine. And so the thing you write is not a main, it's something that main calls. So the first and obvious change is that we have to make a, a different package. So we call it package mustachio. And then we have to import a couple of the App Engine relevant data uh, APIs. Uh, the one we're going to be using today is data store. You might have another three or four, depending on your program. And then we take the setup for HTTP and move it out of our main function and put it into an init. But that's a very mechanical change. There's really nothing interesting going on there. It's very simple. Um, the big change happens because on App Engine, you can't read and write files. And it's sort of a fundamental thing to the way App Engine works. A request might go to one machine, and then the next request on the same client goes to a different machine. If you write files, it's going to be in the wrong place. So we just don't do that. Instead, there's a distributed thing called Data Store, and we store the uh, image we're going to play with inside App Engine's Data Store to make that work. To do that, we need to define a piece of data that we can store in the, inside the Data Store, and we call that an image. And this isn't a very interesting one. It's, it's just a block of data stored inside uh, an image structure. Um, we could, in fact, use Blob Store for this app, which is just a, a bag of, of bits. But um, we made an image because the data store is a little more interesting to work with because it allows more expansion. If we want to add like provenance information or other details to the image, we could do that. Uh, Blob Store would make that harder. So now what we need to do is figure out how to store the image inside the data store. And to do that, we need to define a key that we can store the image under. And the easiest way to do that is just to create a unique key from the data itself. And we can do that. Here, here's a, a really simple function. Actually, quite a lot going on in here. I'm not going to go through it in detail. But what this does is uh, take the uh, string of, of bytes, probably the, was presumably the data from the image, uh, compute the SHA-1 hash of it, and then just take a chunk out of that SHA-1 hash, uh, hexify it and use that as a string that we can use as the key. Um, it's truncated 16 bytes of hex here. Obviously, you can make it the full SHA-1 string, but then you get a URL a foot long. And we probably don't need that much protection. So that's a parameter. You, uh, in principle, you could make it longer. Um, now, once we've done that, we have to take the file management code that Andrew showed you and convert it to data store. And it doesn't actually change all that much, but there's some details. Um, so we, we um, grabbed the, the image before from the request. And now we just copy it into a buffer. So we have a bytes buffer with the, the image data inside it. Then we create this thing called a context, which is an App Engine specific idea that is associated with the request from the client. And that gives you a place to do logging information, things like that. But it also gives you the methods for things like making keys, uh, sorry, to, for accessing the, the elements of the, the client's request. Um, and we use it in order to uh, put the data inside, because it, we want to associate the, the client with the data we're putting into it. So here we create a new key using the key of the data we got. And then using the context in that key, we store the data inside the data store. And so now we have this, this hex string that represents the data that we can use to get it back later. Having done that, as before, we just redirect to the edit handler. But this time, we're using this key that we used instead of a file name. Once the request comes in to, for the, data, for the uh, image, we recover the data just by sort of inverting the process. Uh, calculating what the context is again, giving, uh, using the ID from the form value to recover the data, and doing a data store.get to pull it out again, um, checking errors, of course, all the time. And then once we've got the data, we can just call image.decode on it, just as we did before. So um, one other major difference when you're using App Engine is you don't have, uh, you can't just read and write network sockets. You have to use this thing called the URL fetch API. Um, and to, to do that, there's this, uh, there's a fair bit of adjustments you have to make to the way that the OAuth flow works, but it doesn't change all that much. The, the, URL, the URL fetch API has this concept of a transport that lets you describe how to make requests through the App Engine infrastructure to general HTTP interfaces. And all we really have to do here is take the OAuth transport mechanism and insert that into the uh, structure for the transport for URL fetch, which we do by constructing one of these uh, transport objects here. Having done that, it all just kind of flows together. And that's really all you've got to do. So with all that done, you want to deploy it. What do you have to do? Well, the first thing you have to do is describe to App Engine what your app looks like. 
And there's two parts to that. One is you have to write a, a, a thing called app.yaml. Uh, it's, a, it's a very, uh, well, I think it's a ridiculous name, but it's the one everyone knows. Um, and inside that app.yaml file, you write down uh, a bunch of very simply defined fields, including your app ID, runtime colon go, which is the big news, uh, and then say where the handlers go and how they're associated with your program. Having this last line on the script, uh, it tells the development app server uh, what kind of program you're playing with here. Um, then to assemble the app, what you need to do is take all your source code and put it together in one directory hierarchy and put the app YAML file at the root. It's easy, an easy enough thing to put the HTML files in the root as well. Um, and then in the subdirectories in various places, you put the source code. We've put the, the two files from Mustachio into the Mustachio subdirectory. That makes the package Mustachio. And then we also have to bring along any third-party apps that we needed that were not part of the App Engine infrastructure by default. So here we need to bring along the free type Go and the Go Auth 2 packages. And these get uploaded from source. Uh, and then once they're uploaded, they will be compiled in the cloud and deployed from a statically linked binary in the cloud. So to, to test it out, once you've got all this put together, you can run the development app server with a thing that's very familiar looking to app, app engine users. You just run the dev app server.py with the path to your app and it brings up the local thing. And at that point, you're essentially running a program equivalent to what Andrew showed you, except the data store is just uh, local stuff on your machine. Once you're satisfied with that story, you can use the app config to deploy the app into Google's cloud using the app config update from exactly the same tree. And once that's going, you can access it in the cloud by your app ID .appspot.com. I wonder if it's going to work. Okay. Let's see. Uh, no, I'm in the right place. Okay. Um, this is a, a version of uh, mustachio.appspot.com, which is running in Google's infrastructure. Uh, we've made it a little prettier. We've put a little more graphics in it, but the source code is, is largely the same as the one we showed you. We just made it prettier for the purpose. Now, because it's an app engine, we need a different picture, one more representative. So let's bring this guy up, and there he is. Okay. So we've now stored that image inside the, uh, inside the data store, inside the Google Cloud. We can play with him. Um, I think this guy actually looks like a French pilot now, so let's give him the appropriate French look. Maybe a little smaller. Come on, we can do it. Yeah, there we go. And I think we want, no, that's a little too much. That's a little too Spanish. <laughs> Let's go French. No, that's not right. There we go. There he is. There's our French pilot. And now, of course, we want to share it as we did before, which we do in the usual way. It says, do you want to share uh, to your buzz access? And that, that uh, icon, as before, now is now telling us that the real mustachio guy wants to share your buzz information or buzz authentication, you allow access, and it says it's there. So the image is still there, but now if we go to the buzz, it should be posted for real, and we can click on it, and all your friends can now see that. So that's live in, in Google Hub. No demo effect today, that's impressive, okay. All right. Um, I think you're probably asking at this point, if you don't know already, uh, what about me? Can I do this? And the answer is yes, I can do this. Can you do this? Um, not quite yet, but almost. Um, we're announcing that Go is going to be a fully supported language on App Engine, although today it's launching as an experimental feature, which limits how much you can use it, number of users you can have. There's no billing. Experimental is a well-defined term in App Engine space, and Go is definitely an experimental feature. But it's real, and it works. Um, as of today, the SDK is publicly available for download. So right now, you can go to the site, grab the SDK, and start writing uh, an App Engine app in Go that will uh, run on your local machine to, to debug it and test it. Uh, we're about to start uh, sign-ups for trusted testers for uh, production into the cloud for real. Uh, if you're interested in being a trusted tester, there's a sign up. Uh, um, the details are on the, our blog, which is now live at blog.golang.org. And uh, if you want to be in there, sign up. We'll be rolling it out over the next few weeks. It should be fully out within a few weeks. Um, most of the App Engine APIs you're familiar with from other languages are supported, and the list is growing, and they're all being worked on actively. And of course, they're all open source, so uh, feel free to look at what's going on there. Um, and I would like to make it very clear that I did not do any of the work on this 
myself. This was entirely done by the team, and I'd like to give a special thanks to the guys who did all the hard work, which is uh, David Simons, Nigel Tao, Andrew Durand, who did talk, and plus we got a lot of help from the App Engine people themselves, and I'd really like to thank them. So thanks, guys. Okay, so um, in conclusion, <clears throat> We think that Go is actually a great back-end language for App Engine. I mean, if you think about it, App Engine is this really easy way to build deploy, deploy scalable apps into uh, the infrastructure that Google provides. Go is a language for writing scalable programs. It's just a perfect fit, and it should be. Um, it's, with this environment, you, you get an environment for building web apps that's so really easy and productive to use. It scales really well. Um, the libraries are good, uh, the language is good and getting better all the time. It's also a true compiled language. It's actually the first compiled language for App Engine because uh, Java goes through a JVM, Python is an interpreter. Uh, if you've got some really tight code you need to do, like the image processing stuff we showed you, or maybe some crypto stuff, something like that, um, you can actually get right down to the bare metal in Go, and that's, that's a really nice new option to have available. Um, as I said, you can start using it today. There is the link to the downloads page, and the source code's all online. You can, you're free to look at it, comment, uh, send us mail if you see bugs, play with it, maybe make suggestions if you're interested in helping us get, make it all better. And uh, as of now, there should be one public App Engine service, which is Mustachio, and uh, I expect to see mustaches all over the web by the end of business today. <laughs> so if you want to know more about Go, um, golang.org is a pretty big, page uh, sites growing all the time. There's tutorials, videos. Um, I think this video should be posted there when it's available. Um, there's uh, code walks, and of course, all the source code's accessible through the uh, code.google.com site. Um, the spec is there, and by the way, the Go spec, compared to many other languages, is quite concise and very readable. It's, it's not a huge language, it's quite uh, approachable. Um, we're moving offices now to a, a new smaller office that we have, and I might have to throw away my C++ spec because there might not be room in the new office. So. <laughs> um, the Go blog is, has got all, that, uh, all the stuff I talked about, and the, the newest page, the newest entry there has all the information that we've talked about today. Um, and then if you want to hear more about it or just come talk to us, there are office hours today, sort of now until 3. Uh, we'll hang around to the end of the session, though. Um, and then tomorrow there's an App Engine uh, office hours, and we'll be there with them, and I'm sure that there's questions that you'll have for them as well. So uh, maybe we should start by taking a few questions. Andrew, do you want to come back up? Um, we should probably get the, the feedback. Is there a question, Dory page? No? OK. No, there's no Dory page. OK. Um, so please use the microphones for questions if you have any. No? Nope. Please to come to the mic. Uh, is there support for asynchronous calls? Asynchronous calls? Um, well, the App Engine, kind of, like all web stuff, is kind of asynchronous. I mean, you, you, you use a RESTful API to construct an asynchronous callback through the interface. I mean, that's basically how it works. I'm, I'm not sure what you're But do you, do you mean, in say, in, in a single handler, like in, making... In Go language, yeah. Uh, so it, Go supports some interesting concurrency primitives called Go routines and channels. And they're fully supported under the, the App Engine runtime. And so it's possible, say, if you want to make multiple uh, App Engine API calls, um, you can do them in separate Go routines and get the responses. And all of that should work. Um, the one difference between running Go locally in terms of its concurrency primitives versus uh, deploying to App Engine is that they all run in a single operating system thread now. Um, so you don't get any CPU par parallelism, but you do get the full benefits of our concurrency primitives. That restriction will get lifted. We, we plan to enable threading. But, th but that's not to say that all of your app has to run in a single thread, because there, will, there could be multiple instances on different computers. But for each instance, there will be only a single thread running with all the Go routines. But you still get all the, the, all the nice features of, of Go to be able to schedule multiple outstanding requests and stuff like that. But it works very nicely. It's the same limitation that currently applies to the Python and Java yeah. uh, runtimes. Yeah, we really hope to remove that restriction, though. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, can, you, can you just review why, um, why you thought the world needed another program, programming language and, um, and also why Google are investing so heavily in it? What's, what's their motivation other than you know, yours may be more academic in, interest, but theirs clearly should be more commercial. So how do you... How do you... Well, it's a, it's a perfectly good question. Um, and I think 
we've answered it many times in the past, but I'll answer it again. To be honest, there's already a lot of programming languages in the world, but none of them seem to work well at doing the kind of software that we develop inside Google. Um, they, they work well enough, but it's, they don't solve the, all the problems together well. They're, if you think uh, most of our server software is written in languages like Java and C++, and those languages are uh, fairly large to write in. The, they take a lot of tools to work well. We need distributed compilation farms. Uh, dependency management, particularly in C++, is a nightmare. And there's just a bunch of things that um, tend to slow down development that are purely mechanical and determined by the language rather than necessary to the problem you're working on. On the other hand, um, it, was, it seemed to us that there was a chance to make a much nicer language that worked better with modern hardware that understands concurrency, parallelism, multi-core machines, can support networking better, and things like that. Um, the answer is no. We never needed a new language, but we thought it, it would really make life better if we had one. And it's, it's starting to catch on. I think, I think we, we found a, a, a sweet spot for the balance between pragmatism and, and sort of uh, niceness. Now, one of the things I will say is that when we announced this language, a lot of the programming link community poo-pooed it because they didn't understand why you would have a language that wasn't theoretically exciting. And, and the point was, it's not theoretically exciting, it's just very useful. Um, and that, that, that pragmatic approach to the design of the language is really what makes it so productive. I've never used a language I found more productive. I, I really think it's a nice language. And you know, if you don't enjoy using it, then I'm not gonna twist your arm about it. But you, I think you'll find if you try it, which a lot of the naysayers have not done, that it's actually way more effective than a lot of people think. I like yeah. to use that. I like that. Sorry? Uh, please use the microphone if you want to say something. Yeah. He, he does use it and he does like it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> At the front. Okay. Will you be supporting the App Engine pipeline API? And if so, how does that balance against what Andrew just brought up using separate Go routines at the client level to process? Um, uh, I might have to ask someone from App Engine to answer that question for you. Um, okay. uh, we're sort of covering the, the, the existing core functionality of, of App Engine first. Um, before sort of venturing out into the more experimental features. Um, but our goal is certainly to, imp to uh, implement all of the functionality available um, to the other uh, runtimes. The, the App Engine infrastructure is really designed to be pretty much language neutral because of the way it works. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of writing the APIs and having them fit well in your language. If there's an API that uh, is missing, well, there are a number of APIs that are missing, but um, if there is one that you're particularly interested in, you know, let us know and, and we'll, we'll give it priority to try to get it ready. It's not a big deal to write a, a, a basic API to talk to one of these facilities. Getting the full rich feature set could take a lot more time. But it's not our intention to deliberately ignore any particular API. It was just what we needed to be able to sh launch some demo apps and make it sort of get off the ground. So we have things like Data Store, Blob Store, uh, the User's API, Memcache. the Memcache, you know, the basic mail. set, Mail, mm -hmm. right. Um, but and they'll all be there at some point. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it, it could be also in the case of the pipeline system that uh, it works particularly well in Go because of Go's concurrency support, but I don't know enough about it to say for sure. Yeah, we also have task queues, which I think is not in both the other languages. <coughs> no, it, 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 there is a Java task queue. Yeah, no, it's in Python too, yeah, yeah, task queues. Yeah. Back? Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, this is a great discussion. Uh, I'm new to Go, and one of the concerns I have is library support. Uh, like I was at NodeConf last week and one thing that was really interesting was they talked about DOM on the server side and that opens up for a lot of libraries that are available or previously only available on the client side with JavaScript. Um, so can you just talk about what the true state of like library support is and are there any future directions like for example being able to use you know, Python or Java libraries inside of App Engine that talk with uh, Go? Thanks. Um, so in terms of Go in general, um, library support is improving at a very rapid pace. Um, there are many, many uh, external libraries uh, listed on our package dashboard, which is listed, uh, linked to from golang.org. Um, and those are for accessing many different types of databases or uh, um, protocol buffer support and so on, um, and pr graphics programming, et cetera. But uh, as far as linking non-Go libraries to Go code in App Engine, that's definitely an unknown. Um, it's a, it, it makes the whole process of sandboxing the process for security purposes are much, much more complicated. Um, 
uh, and that's why you can only upload pure Go uh, libraries to the Go App Engine runtime. Um, but as far as being able to, to use more and more libraries across languages, I mean, it's something that we'd definitely be interested in doing, but um, I don't have anything to say about it at this stage. Um, the, I think one of the other questions I have is, first I want to echo what the previous showman said is, is that Go is great, and I can see lots of uses, but I also have lots of Java code that I would like to have Go act as kind of the, the dispatcher around, but the, there's no value to convert from one language to another in many cases. Um, but now my other question is, is how do you handle things like uh, where you have multiple requests fired off and you know something as simple as if none of the requests return in a certain amount of time, return a default. I didn't really see an example of that, but I'd really love to see like how you handle kind of a complex, uh, you know, kind of a fork join kind of thing with, because I suspect that you have some sort of conditional semantics around how to do that. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff in Go concurrency support that makes that stuff work well. Um, there's actually, unrelated to this stuff, there's stuff on the, on the blog, there's been uh, explanations of timeouts and how to use channels to coordinate things. The talk we gave last year actually included a task queue manager presentation, which is relevant to that. Um, it, it's sort of hard to do it spontaneously to explain it, but basically you, you use go routines and channels to construct the architecture and, and you can time things out and it, it's actually very, very easy. Um, it's arguably much easier than using asynchronous callbacks, but that could be largely a matter of taste. I don't know. But it's certainly easy to do. I think a lot easier than certainly in Java. Back? Hi, yeah. Um, how is memory management done with Go? Memory management, it, it's a fully garbage collected language. Okay, great. <laughs> it's actually better than that, though, because the, um, unlike most garbage collected languages, uh, you can have internal pointers, which means that you can have a, uh, for instance, if you have a, a structure and you want to store a buffer, you can put the buffer inside the structure and do only one allocation for it, which means only the overhead of one collector, as opposed to having to do a second allocation to allocate the buffer offline. So it, it's like C in the sense you have complete control over memory layout, but it's a fully garbage collected language nonetheless, and it's also completely safe, memory safe, type safe. So it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting uh, data point. That brings me to my question. Uh, Modern machines depend a lot on the uh, CPU caches for performance, and I was one. And garbage collection algorithms tend to be uh, tend to um, lose cache very rapidly. I was wondering how you handled that engineering trade-off. Well, I sort of half answered the question before. The thing is that if you a garbage collector isn't free, right? If you have a garbage collector, there's an overhead to run it. There's no question about that. There's also an overhead if you're a programmer and you don't have a garbage collector language to manage the memory. And we decided to make the trade-off to away from putting the load on the programmer, which means the garbage collector has to be there. And also, for concurrent languages, garbage collector is a must, because you can't be dealing with multiple threads, dealing with multiple bits of memory and figuring out who owns what. But in return for that, you have complete control over memory. So if you understand that it's a garbage collected language, which you should if you're writing performance-intensive code, and you understand what the costs are for allocating and freeing memory, it's possible to construct your app so that it does only the minimum amount of allocation beyond what's necessary, and so it ends up being, in principle, as efficient as, say, a C program. And it, it, you have to know what you're doing to get that, but at least it's possible, right? Whereas in, in, in a language like Java, where you just have to let the system deal with the memory, it's much harder to control allocation. For instance, if you get a client request, in principle, you can put everything you need into a single allocation and let the, the, the thing handle that. I mean, it's not easy to do that, but in principle, you could do a single allocation per client. And, and make it work. I mean, I think it'd be really a challenge, but you could do it, whereas it's not even possible in, in most garbage collector languages. So we try to help you out. Somebody at the back? Uh, <clears throat> um, Gwit and Android would be nice places to see Go show up next. Yes, they would. Yeah. Any <laughs> timeline plans? Can't, I, Skunk yeah. works? Yeah, can't talk about it. So can you talk a little bit more about the compiler that's used on uh, Google App Engine? What, yes. Is it open source also? It's open source, yes. The compiler's open source. It is the uh, bizarrely named 6G compiler. So it's a 64-bit x86 compiler 
um, written uh, in C, but it compiles Go code into a, uh, after the linker, a statically linked binary that, that just gets deployed as the binary. So you upload your source, it gets compiled by this compiler. At, you, if you go to golang.org, you'll find the links to the open source place, code.google.com slash p slash go. The compiler's there, so you, it's fully open source compiler, library, everything. Okay. It's all open source. So and, uh, another question about uh, scripting. Uh, we'd like to see it run in, in the browser too, go. So would we. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, we're on your side, if <laughs> we really are. <laughs> you get this. Any more questions? Um, has our, has our uh, surprise arrived? <laughs> yes? Yep. Was that a yes? Okay. Was that, was that a, it was a yes, right? It was a yes, yes. Okay, as you leave, uh, don't forget that to uh, talk about what you heard here on Twitter. Check the feedback forms out. And also, you may find there's a collection of gophers waiting outside for everybody. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for coming. Have fun.